I have been pondering this week, as I do nearly every week, what message we most need to hear from the gospel in our lives together. This is usually some combination of what I think you need to hear and what I think I need to say and what I think the Holy Spirit is trying to say. This week is no exception, uh, but the stakes seem higher. After all, this is Palm Sunday, Passion Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week, which sets the stage for Easter. Not only is there far too much biblical material to address in a single sermon, we in the church have also inherited some messes which may need to be cleaned up. Let me say a little bit more about the messy part. Whether you are consciously aware of it or not, there is a whole field of theology which has developed around the crucifixion of Christ and what that means and how it accomplished our salvation. The broad term for this is atonement theology. Atonement is literally at one meant. How do humans become at one with God? How did Jesus' death make sinners at one with the divine? You won't find specific atonement in the Gospels, particularly in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They mostly tell the story of the crucifixion, what happened, not what it meant. The Gospel of John has a bit more interpretive material. John was the last of the four Gospels and was written after most of the eyewitnesses to the crucifixion had passed away and believers were beginning to wrestle with the questions, we know that this happened, what does it mean for us? We find more theology in the teachings of the church which we read in the letters of Paul, but atonement theology really gets revved up with the early church fathers and into the Middle Ages. There are four major theories which have become a part of Western thought. I'm going to outline them briefly for us this morning. Notice that most of them use some kind of metaphor to help us understand the saving work of Christ. This is really complicated stuff that we're dealing with. And it's helpful to have some kind of image from our own culture or from our own experience to help us make sense of it. So bear with me. Here's the condensed version of about 1,500 years of theological reflection. The earliest, the earliest theory of the atonement is the moral influence theory. The earliest theologians of the church, led by Peter Abelard, believed that Jesus came in order to give us an example of how to live. And that the influence of Jesus' teaching and ministry and even his martyrdom would show us the way to God. The second one is the Christus Victor, which is Latin for Christ the Victor, a theory which was first proposed by Irenaeus. It takes two slightly different forms. One is that we are slaves to sin and under the power of Satan and that in order to buy our freedom, God had to have a ransom. And that ransom was the perfect life of Jesus Christ, was the only thing worth enough to buy the freedom of humanity. A variation on this is that rather than a ransom, Jesus defeated Satan in a spiritual battle, and his victory wins our freedom frees us from slavery to sin. The satisfaction theory is the next one. This was developed in the 11th century by a monk named Anselm. It uses a medieval legal metaphor. We owe a debt to God. We are servants, and our sin has insulted our Lord. God's honor must be satisfied. We can't pay that debt on our own. 
Only the perfect sacrifice of Jesus can pay the price for our sin. That's the only way that God can be satisfied. And the final one is the substitution theory. This is another legal theory. It became popular in the Reformation. It says that we have broken God's moral law and God is angry. Someone needs to be punished for that sin. We are the ones who deserve to be punished. But instead of punishing us, Jesus, God punishes his perfect son, Jesus, instead. Jesus is substituted for us and bears punishment in our place. Now, like any metaphor that gets pushed further than it ought to be, some of these theories of the atonement have been misused. I find some of the implications of the wrath of God and Jesus being punished in our place to be particularly troubling. These are some of the messes which contemporary theologians are trying to clean up. So maybe it's time for some other metaphors. This isn't just an academic discussion. These are views which are at the heart of our faith. Atonement shapes our understanding of God and our relationship to Jesus Christ. This is the story of how we are and who we are as Christians. Some of my kids were home for spring break this week. I came home from a meeting one evening and found them, Joel and Becca and her husband Stephen, in the middle of a game. This game is called Pandemic. Has any of you ever seen this before? Joel has seen it. Joel could tell you the end of this story. It has a great picture on the front of a woman in a white lab coat looking especially heroic. Here's the setup of the game. The board for the game is a map of the world with cities all over it. And you draw cards and start diseases at different, there are four different diseases that you are trying to eradicate. And they start at different places on the board. And then you draw cards that make outbreaks spread to neighboring cities. Uh, the different players are different characters. There's a medic and a quarantine specialist and a researcher and a contingency planner. And you play cooperatively to see if all together you can eradicate these, and these epidemics. And the tagline for the game is, can you save humanity? And the answer was, for us, no. We couldn't save humanity. Four reasonably bright and motivated and cooperative people could not save humanity. And the worst part was, we knew it. About 90 minutes into the game, when stuff was spreading all over that board, we looked at each other and said, we can't stop it. We're not going to make it. We're all going to die. And although there was no actual human suffering involved, except for maybe the four of us, we felt terrible. We had failed humanity. So we did what any group of reasonably bright and motivated and cooperative folks would do. We changed the rules. <laughs> we stopped drawing cards that made bad things happen and gave ourselves special powers so that we could eradicate those diseases and save humanity. And here is the amazing thing about that story. I am someone who tries intentionally to think theologically. And I had been wrestling with my ideas about the atonement all that week. And it still took me two days before I realized that my children had handed me the metaphor. Sin is the pandemic which has infected our world. And despite the efforts 
of reasonably bright, motivated, and sometimes cooperative people to keep it under control, sin continues to spread. And it's deadly. But this is not our world. It's God's world. And God wrote the rules. And God actually does have the means to save humanity. And that means is Jesus Christ. It's worth noting that in Greek, the language of the New Testament, that the word for save and the word for heal are the same word. There's no distinction in the New Testament between salvation and healing. So the words of John 3:17 could just as well read, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be healed through him. So brothers and sisters, if we have received the cure for the illness which is killing the world, which God loves, we have no business keeping that medicine to ourselves. We especially have no business saying that that's not our business. It is wonderful that there are people in this congregation who are committed to sharing Jesus Christ. But that's not the work of a special program or an event or of one ministry team. People are dying and we have the cure. We don't have to be obnoxious or rude or pushy or force anything on anybody. It might be uncomfortable or even a little risky, but other people need to know through our example, through our sharing, through our friendship, that God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that we don't have to perish. We can be healed. I can preach about atonement, but listening to me is not the same as internalizing it for yourself. I know we have a busy week coming up. They're set up to do for love feast, preparing food for Easter, decorating the chancel, hosting an Easter egg hunt. These are all things that take time and effort and we're grateful for the people who do them. But if we get to Easter, and we have not made the space to consider what Jesus' death means for us and how we would share that with somebody else. We have planned the party and forgotten to invite the guest of honor. Even if the food and the decorations are great, if we haven't invited Jesus, we've missed the point. So, I would challenge you to open your Bibles this week. Every week, but especially this week. Read the story of Jesus and his love. The Passion accounts are at the end of each gospel. We have tried to provide you resources in the Bible study materials. There are scripture materials here, and Team Spirit will meet with you during the week if you choose to do that. Consider your own understanding of how Jesus' death makes us one with God. We will enact some of the story in our love feast on Thursday. We'll give you opportunities to walk through the events of Good Friday. You don't have to have all the answers. Nobody has all the answers. But it is a cop-out to never even ask the questions. I believe that the Holy Spirit is in our questions as well as in our answers. May God's Spirit walk with you through this week and into the dawn of Easter. May God bless our questions 
and our answers. Amen.